I could see panic spread through the group as I told them what Alice and I had seen. Agent Kellerson demanded his service rifle back immediately. This gun is government property, he said petulantly, like a child demanding a toy. It's mine by all rights. It's registered to me. You lost your right to the gun when you tried to kill me, I said, raising the barrel and putting it in his face. If you want it back, then try to take it. I dare you. Come get it. Richie got between the two of us, pushing us apart. Come on, guys. We got enough problems without killing each other. We're wasting time standing here arguing. The clock is running down quickly. He pulled his phone out of his pocket, checking the time. It's already been over two hours. We got a little less than an hour left until time runs out, and whatever they're planning to do comes about. I don't think we want to be anywhere near here when that happens. Alice continuously complained about the pain in her legs. She pulled her pants leg up to show me the angry red splotches that blossomed around the stitches. A small trickle of dark, almost black blood ran down her legs, and I saw it had already stained her pants on one side. We'll get you to a doctor as soon as we get out of here, but we have to keep going. We can't carry you the whole way. We'd reached a peak of the hill surrounding the town and began to descend. The next town over was in a deep valley, and we'd have to stumble down steep rock trails to get there. From a distance, I heard the screaming of many powerful engines. I looked up to see fighter jets passing overhead in a blur, breaking the sound barrier. I felt the sonic boom in my bones as it passed through my body, vibrating my chest. I involuntarily clamped my teeth down on my lip when it went past, drawing a thin line of blood. Their roar started to fade into the distance before being punctuated by multiple explosions. I saw flashes of light exploding from the center of town, like a second sun rising in the night. A mushroom cloud of black smoke rose high into the sky, mixing with the dark clouds above. That's not good, Agent Kellerman said, wiping sweat from his forehead as he stared dumbly back in the direction of the explosion. Why not? Alice asked, keeping close to my side and limping heavily, trying to avoid her injured leg and wincing every time she put weight on it. Once they start the airstrikes, it means they've lost total control on the ground. You don't think they'd use nuclear weapons on it, do you? Richie asked. Agent Kellerman shook his head. No, that would raise too many red flags. Radioactivity gets out and spreads, and it's detected by people all around the world. That's how some people in Europe knew about Chernobyl's nuclear explosion, even before the Soviet government announced it. No, they'd contain it with high-yield conventional explosions and artillery, and if that failed, they'd likely spray chemical weapons until the area became uninhabitable for hundreds of years. They have enough secret stockpiles to wipe out a hundred towns this size without making a dent. They might decide to drop nerve gas or cyclosarin from crop dusters and helicopters. When they do, we want to be as far upwind to the target area as we can get. What if we just get to the next town over and discover the same kind of craps going on over there? I asked, seeing a nightmarish vision of empty streets littered with murdered bodies. I think my will would have broken if I had arrived there and found it filled with psychotic twins, especially after the loss of my family and very likely the death of all my friends who'd lived nearby, except, of course, for Richie. Little did I realize at the time that some of our group would not see the next town. Within minutes, two of us would be dead. I was walking next to Richie, Alice, limping along in front of us, Agent Kellerson walking in the rear, continuously checking the trail behind us for signs of stalkers. I felt watched from all sides. I wonder what kind of fuel that craft runs on, Richie says. Hydrogen fusion, or antimatter, or maybe some kind of quantum state? We don't even know about yet. Actually, the government's reverse-engineered at least one of those crafts, Kellerson said. It had an outer shell composed of spinning substance called Bose-Einstein condensate, a type of superfluid that defies gravity. In the center, but we never got to hear about the engine. In a blur, two figures ran out of the bushes, wielding axes, dripping blood. With eyes bulging, I saw my doppelganger swing the axe down towards my head, I felt as if I saw it all in slow motion. I raised the automatic rifle and pulled the trigger. The recoil made the gun raise up high as a burst of gunfire shattered the nightmare silence. 
The bullet missed the doppelganger by mere inches, smashing into the tree a few inches above his head and raining splinters down on his hair and face. Realizing I'd run out of time, I tried to lunge to the side, but the axe caught me hard in the right shoulder. I felt it slice through my skin and shatter my collarbone. I fell back, arm going numb from the sudden shock of the brutal attack. As I landed on the ground, the wind getting knocked out of my lungs, I saw Agent Kellerson stumble back, the blade of an axe stuck in his forehead. He raised his hand to his spurting face, smacking his forehead as if he was trying to remember something important. His lips opened, gasping, his legs trembling before he fell forward, the impact forcing the axe deeper into his skull. His murderer, his identical twin, lunged forward, wrenching at the axe, trying to pull it free. With every jerk to the left and right, more gouts of blood gushed out. Richie fought back against his doppelganger. I saw his lunatic twin raising a gleaming butcher's knife. Richie had his hands up in supplication, the small paring knife held loosely in one hand as he tried to back away. The doppelganger began to swing the blade wildly, two strokes slicing deep into Richie's chest. And then Alice began to scream behind us. I turned to see her crawling away from the mayhem, a small silhouette crouched in the bushes only a few feet away, only the white, grinning teeth showing in the thick shadows of the brush, gleaming like some demonic Cheshire cat. As if stuck in a nightmare, I saw our group being slaughtered from all sides. Slowly, too slowly, I grabbed for the gun, seeing the flash of metal out of the corner of my eyes as my doppelganger came in for the killing blow. I raised the gun above my head at the last possible moment, bracing myself for the blow. The blade came down on the side of the gun, sending jarring vibrations through my body. My shoulder felt like it was nearly pulled out of the socket, but at least I was alive. I spun the barrel towards his face, pulling the trigger. It blew apart his cheek and nose, and for a moment, I saw into my own skeletal face, the grinning teeth half-blown to shards, as the figure swayed like a boxer before a knockout. Then he fell forward, landing heavily on top of me, covering me with my own blood and somehow familiar stickiness and smell emanating from it as it flowed out. I fought against the corpse, kicking and rolling. The dead weight of it pressed the gun down on my chest. I heard Alice's pained shrieks and, even more terrifying, nothing at all from Richie. As I rolled the corpse off myself, heaving with a sudden burst of energy, I realized I couldn't move or feel my right hand. I looked down and saw it, white and pale, laying as limp as a dead starfish. Using my left, I grabbed the gun, turning towards Agent Kellerson's doppelganger. I saw him standing over Richie's dead body, swinging the axe again and again into the meat of Richie's chest. Richie lay there, staring at me, his eyes wide and horrified, his eyes seeming to become black as his pupils dilated in death. With every blow of the axe, his body shook as... If he were saying no. I shot the agent's doppelganger, my vision turning blurry for a moment. The burst of gunfire made my ears ring. With the shrieking tinnitus blurring into my head, I turned towards Alice. I saw two Alices, dressed in identical clothing, both covered in blood and cuts. They bit and grabbed at each other, and I had no idea what to do. Then I realized that one of the doppelgangers was missing. I heard the rustling of bushes directly behind me. In the top of my vision, I saw the knife coming down. I rolled, but it slammed hard into my white dead palm, pinning the numb hand to the ground as blood rushed up from the wound. With my other hand, I raised the gun and pointed it at the grinning figure of Richie. Without hesitation, I fired, opening up multiple holes in the center of his chest. I turned back to the Alice's, wondering what the hell I should do. But as I looked over, I found I was too late. One stood over the other, choking her, pinning her to the ground. The girl on top had blood seeping from her leg, and I had a surge of hope. That had to be the real Alice. The other one's face had turned purple, deepening and darkening into a sticky, suffocating shade, her lips turning blue. As she died, a wave of heat and light overtook us. An explosion rocked the earth moments later, shockwaves passing through the ground. I turned back to the town and saw a massive mushroom cloud rising high in the air. 
It seemed nothing was left of it. In front of the massive ball of fire and smoke that emanated from the center of town, a large blue cloud glimmered in the air. Soon, I saw the alien craft speeding towards us in a blur, leaving the area that they had just obliterated. They came towards Alice and me, the ship hovering above the trees. Moments later, the humanoid skinned beings faded into existence in front of me. I just stood on the ground with a gushing wound and a dead hand, stunned and in agony. Alice looked no better, covered in blood, her leg wound ripped open again, her face white and pale. She was breathing fast and trembled, looking like she might collapse. She stared at the three beings that manifested in front of us with a blank look on her face. You two are the last ones left alive, the one in front said, its bone white tentacles writhing like snakes. Behind the mass of tentacles on its face, I caught a glimpse of two intelligent round eyes, pure white and lidless. They looked moist and glistened like opals, shining with color. Barely, I whispered. The being took out a strange black vial. With a reverent stance, he knelt down before me, cradling my head in his hand. Then he took some of my blood from the wound. He stood and walked over to Alice, repeating this strange ritual. Then he talked to the others in a weird guttural language with clicks and hisses mixed in randomly, the cadence fast and excited. He turned back to me. You are the survivors. You both are. You've proven yourself worthy. You are worthy of life. When the cleansing comes, the time of renewal, we will exterminate all life unworthy of it and start your people anew from the blood of the survivors. A second Adam and a second Eve. Perhaps this time they will actually be created in the image of God, the true God, ourselves. I saw at that moment that the two aliens behind him held small black canisters in their hands. One walked over to me and another walked over to Alice, spraying us both in the face. The world spun and my vision went black. I felt myself being lifted up before I was gone completely. I woke up in a hospital in the state capital. Alice was in the next room. We had no memory of how we'd got there and who had dropped us off. After all was said and done, I ended up losing most of my right arm in an emergency surgery. The injury from the axe wound had severed nerve endings and caused severe blood loss to the entirety of my limb. It had caused irreparable oxygen deprivation and permanent tissue death, too. The surgeon said I got to them just in time. But as the months passed, I felt I'd lost something more fundamental, something greater been in contact with Alice's foster family and they said she's acting strange, not talking. I wonder if I made a mistake. The entire experience was a nightmare and I want to erase it from my memory forever. It led to the death of my family, my friends, and the crippling of my body. I can only hope that I never see those writhing bone white tentacles again. You're still here. Thanks so much for joining us for tonight's spooky tale. If you'd like a little bit more spooky in your life, why not click on one of the videos that appears at the end of our story? Or maybe head on over to one of our playlists where you can get your fill of spooky content. If you like your spooky a little more tactile, I've got a new book that's come out. If you'd like your own copy, there's a link below in the description where you can get your own copy of my spooky book. If you like what you see here on the channel and think you might like to support in a more monetized way, then why not come over to Patreon or become a member on YouTube? Speaking of, let's go ahead and thank our members now. Thanks to Siv Garstead and Unicorn Hollow for being our spooky ghost contributors. Thanks to Psycat, Lee Kendall, Janet, and Chris Kinsella for being our spooky skeleton tier contributors. And, of course, thanks to Zeronin, Winter, Tyler Parker, Stephanie Carrington, Sarah ASMR, Hi Stacy, Emily Coltsfoot, and Cinnamon Fox, and Bella Lee for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. As I said, if you'd like to have your name read out at the end of every episode that I make, and maybe get a little more, 
come on down to Patreon and sign up, or become a member on YouTube. Ghostly Reader tier contributors get a book anytime I write one, which is usually about twice a year. So, what are you waiting for? Come on down and give it a look. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.